Matariki is the Māori name for the star cluster Pleiades, also known as the Seven Sisters. Matariki is also the name for an international network of seven universities that are distinguished by their historic traditions and unique approach to facing contemporary challenges. The Matariki Lecture Series offers a short programme of lectures addressing current research themes or areas of common interest. This time, the lecture series is on race, racism and decolonisation, with a specific focus on racism and social determinants of health. Yeah. Hold on, I'm just unmuting and doing it all and I'm about to share my screen. There we are, getting that up. View as, uh, as uh, a slideshow, there we are. Okay, before I start, I'd like to just um, acknowledge Professor Jill Milroy's um, Welcome to Country that she did. As she mentioned, I'm part of, um, she's my boss. Um, so I'm part of the School of Indigenous Studies, the Post Centre for Indigenous Health here at UWA. Um, and we live and work on beautiful Noongar Buja, Noongar country. My people, however, are actually from the Kimberley. So they're up um, from the north west coast. Um, but I've lived and worked in beautiful Noongar country for most of my life, in actual fact. So that's a little bit about me. Um, uh, today, I'm, I'm taking a different um, approach to the whole issue of social determinants and racism and um, the topic of my little talk, which I will try and keep brief, is social and emotional wellbeing, dismantling um, systemic racism. So, so I think that racism has happened in a whole bunch of different ways, particularly for Indigenous peoples that who within settler countries. Um, and I mean, that's where in countries where the dominant society is a, um, a, a Western, usually white society, and that would be include us here in, in Australia, um, New Zealand, the United States of America and Canada, and I'm sure there's more as well, but um, we're the Indigenous people of um, settler country, so to speak. But before I go on, I didn't get, we actually took out my slide of the beautiful um, uh, map of Australia with all the Aboriginal language groups in it. Unfortunately, we were doing last minute changes and I wish I had have left it in now. So you need to envisage that yourself, my dears. Um, who are in the audience, but basically um, Aboriginal people occupied all of Australia before colonisation. And that's been a relatively recent experience for us, um, unlike the rest of the world. Um, but right now we, we are um, in recovery from the, those impacts of colonisation, which I'll go a bit into later. But in Australia, we've got about 25 million people and of that population, there's about 790,000 that are Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people. Um, so we're the Indigenous people of this country. Um, most, most of us are one cultural group, being Aboriginal mainland um, people, but there are a, a group of islands that are our Indigenous brothers and sisters, and they're about 5% of our total population. Um, and there's a group too that have intermarried across. So our, our, while we are diverse in our language groups, um, there's a great deal of um, similarity across mainland Aboriginal people. But um, we know that we know that uh, our statistics tell a very um, bleak picture of our situation. There's disadvantage across all the um, measurements, whether they're, they're um, economic, health and so on. But we know I'm going to focus on mental health because my background and my work is in Indigenous mental health and wellbeing. But we know that the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander suicide rates are two to three times higher than the rest of um, the Australian population. We know that um, they do great measurements and they do great surveys. We have um, 
excellent reports on how disadvantaged that happened all the time and they collect um, excellent statistics about us, which is good because then we use that, that um, uh, data to leverage change. But we know that on measurements of psychological distress, there's um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that have two and a half times the higher psychological um, distress than other people. For Aboriginal um, Torres Strait Islander youth, um, almost two in three experience significant stresses or adverse life events. And for Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander youth, again, one in three reported um, being treated It's very prevalent. And um, my internet, is that my freezing up? Oh, I get this little message come up saying your internet connection is unstable. So I'm just going to ignore it and presume all is well. Um, but that's not the only this. We've got Reconciliation Australia that does a barometer measuring um, racism or the race relations between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and mainstream um, Australians. And that shows that Aboriginal people feel that they are the victims of racism um, and that they are very much marginalised and excluded. Um, now, the reason why these, usually I don't take a negative um, deficit-based um, approach, but the reason why this is important is that it, it um, says something. We're talking about um, we're talking about ongoing racism, systematic or, and um, institutionalised racism and cultural racism. So these are all the different um, sorts of um, racism that impact on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And we, we know that because we have the stats and so we know, as I mentioned earlier, there's multiple frequent and severe exposure to stresses. Um, that weakens our resilience. There's triple um, the average of uh, rates of high to very high psychological distress. There's a big service gaps um, because Aboriginal people have not been welcomed into um, services and a lot of work needs to happen to change that. So um, there's a lack of culturally appropriate primary mental health care services. There's institutionalised racism where people aren't um, going to mainstream mental health or suicide prevention services. This is showing up in double the, the uh, average rates of hospitalisation for mental health condition and double the rates of suicide. This also contributes to violence and trauma unemployment and poverty, imprisonment, community, family, family and cultural stress. Um, this in turn becomes, um, there's also additional um, stresses, but this becomes a whole um, uh, a cycle of um, negativity. So, so we need a circuit breaker. We need a circuit breaker because things are just going to get worse. Um, and the way we do have some ideas for ways forward, except my my power, uh, slide, yes, here we are. So there's been a lot of work recently and we've been fortunate and honoured to be a part of that work of looking at, um, first of all, making mainstream services culturally appropriate. Um, that's been a big thing. To have Australia acknowledge its racism is another big issue and, and there's been a lot of work and activity around that, but also to develop our own um, uh, paradigms of what an Indigenous wellbeing or notion of self is, what an Indigenous um, effective, culturally appropriate service would look like. So this is only one model in a whole bunch of amazing models that are um, coming up from the community, but we've been very much, much occupied in working with social and emotional wellbeing. And that says that if you have a notion of self, uh, you know, Western perceptions of psychology or mental health are concerned, well, well, your mental self is in your head and your body and your behaviours and maybe your emotions. But we say that um, it's not only that, it's that, but it is also your, um, your connection to your family and your kinship for Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people maybe. It is your connection to your community, your connection to your culture, 
your country and land and your connection to your spirit, spirituality and ancestors. And all around that, ah, um, this is not a static um, model. Um, it, it's shaped by and influenced by social determinants, cultural determinants, historical determinants and political determinants. So we've, it's very much um, influenced by those things. Um, we were very active in the past where we um, worked on the national strategic framework for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's mental health and social and emotional well-being. Um, we did a lot of work. There was national um, consultations um, for this framework. Uh, the government did um, sign off on it, implement However, I have an opportunity now. We will be um, having a big gathering next week and um, we're part of um, bodies, uh, national bodies, where we will have an opportunity to renew that framework and to have it implemented properly. But just to go, go quickly through it, because um, I've got someone saying five minutes left, um, you can read the principles um, that are that are a part of the, our, our strategic framework and that SEWB model that I put up earlier, but they are about self-determination. They are about culturally valid understandings, um, that um, recognising the trauma of colonisation. You know, it was in my lifetime that um, we were still um, uh, imprisoned in a sense. My mother grew up in a mission um, and, um, and she was taken away from her mother. So in our living memory and experience, we've, we've got people who are either um, removed or stolen generation and we weren't given the same human rights and choices that that normal people would have, normal or um, normal citizens would have as free people of the country. So being brought up institutions, being removed off country as well for some people. Um, but racism and stigma needs to be um, recognised because that, that is a part of our, um, our daily lives, you know, and environmental adversity as well. But um, the final point of um, that, the guiding principle, is that it must be recognised, and this is, um, I think, the one that makes us feel strong. It must be recognised that Aboriginal Torres Strait Island people have many strengths, creativity and endurance and a deep understanding um, of the, uh, uh, the relationship between human beings and their environment. So we bring to the table um, strengths and, and contributions as well to um, the healing of our, our society, our people and our world. Um, so this diagram that I spoke about, I have Indigenous psychologists who have actually used that to to um, their own clients. So it's while well, it, the preference is for our people in the first instance, whatever we bring and develop will benefit all of us. But um, we come from a history, even the um, social emotional being um, model was not, um, while well, Indigenous psychologists got it together in the form that it um, was to, is now, it comes from a history of um, Indigenous struggle and, um, you know, Indigenous organisations coming together to, to, um, to say what they needed to happen, what was culturally appropriate for them. So that's a list of um, where it came from. And there is a political part of whatever we do um, in mental health and health, but, you know, that is just how it is for us. And we're very proud of that too, actually. Um, just um, to uh, finish, um, there are a lot of really good programs, um, some are very community-based and very different culturally. Some are um, based in mainstream. We have this amazing book called Working Together, um, that myself, Helen Milroy, our Aboriginal um, psychiatrist, and Ros Walker uh, worked upon. And that's become, we're very um, privileged that that became the Bible of the area. And there's lots of Indigenous authors, non-Indigenous authors. So there's a lot of information in that. 
We continue to do research in a culturally appropriate way with our communities. And um, next week, for instance, we'll be having our, our second social emotional wellbeing gathering where we will be talking to the Aboriginal um, medical services, um, other researchers, policy makers about, um, you know, what would a good social emotional wellbeing service look like? What, what's the workforce needed to deliver that? And how can that also be expressed in mainstream organisations as well as the community controlled organisations? So um, I won't speak about um, our brilliant um, Transforming Indigenous Mental Health and Wellbeing Grant. Um, I'd, uh, there's a list of um, links at the end of this presentation which will be made available. Please go and have a look. We're doing lots of different projects um, uh, with different community groups in our grant and we're very proud of some of those and some of them are very innovative, working with traditional healers and whatnot. Um, but um, do you have a uh, consider following us on Twitter. We're pretty interesting if I don't say so myself and also on the Centre for Best Practice in Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Suicide Prevention. And I think I've just came in on time, so I will say thank you, everyone. There are additional slides in this PowerPoint, um, but um, I will uh, uh, just make it available so you can have some additional um, information later as a, like a dessert, but without us. Um, and that's just some of the people who are um, the very um, eminent people who are involved in our grant, some of the eminent organisations that are involved in our grant, um, a beautiful video which we love and we thought if we had the time, we would have loved to share this with you all, but it would have taken up all my talk time. But um, do have a look at this. It's a very, it's an animation um, that was led by Aboriginal people in the health department of our state, but it's a good um, capture of, um, you know, the story of colonisation, what happened to us and what we need to have done to recover. So um, uh, that's our gift to you. And um, if anyone wants to working together book, if you Google it, you can, um, you can download it as well. That's my talk, so I'll do the top stop sharing. There we are. And say thank you. Mm.